Good evening, everybody, and welcome to all of you who have joined us for tonight's webinar and also the viewers who are watching the recording at some later date. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise the continuing connections of lands, waters and communities. I wish to pay respect to elders past and present and acknowledge the memories, traditions, cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. My name's Steve Trommel and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a GP by background, currently Professor of General Practice Curriculum and Workforce at Deakin University uh, in the Western District of Victoria. We've got a great panel tonight. The webinar, sorry, the bios were disseminated before the webinar with the invitation to join. So I won't go through them in detail, but we do want to meet them uh, to find out uh, who's going to be sharing their expertise and sense of teamwork tonight. So first off, most importantly, is Chloe. Now, welcome, Chloe. I should explain to our participants or our audience that um, you have chosen not to show your image tonight. So there's nothing wrong with people's equipment, um, but um, uh, you can be heard. So Chloe, you've mentioned in your bio that you work to support young people uh, and their mental health. So what do you find particularly rewarding about this role? Um, from a lived experience point of view, um, being able to work with these young people, it's it reminds you of a journey that you've been through yourself. Um, so being able to talk to them as real people, getting to understand them, even if we don't really understand them, but letting them know that somebody's listening to them, that's the most rewarding, and being able to build a rapport with them, it's its incredible how far that can get them um, and giving them, you know, the, the opportunity to be able to grow up and be able to share what's going on for them um, and being treated like humans. Fantastic. Well, it's so good to have you tonight, and we expect to hear a lot from you about your perspective, so that's great. Um, we'll keep moving around the group now, and the next person we'll be hearing from is Zonia, Zonia Wideman there from Queensland. Now, Zonia, you were involved with implementing a virtual care initiative uh, there in Ipswich. So can you tell us how this has helped consumers? Yes, it was a great honour to actually establish a team um, that specialises in the treatment of people with, uh, living with a personality disorder. And embedded within this team was a consumer portal. So this enabled uh, people to access their care teams, including their care work, their peer workers via multiple methods, for example, chat function, video conferencing. Um, and it just provided people an enhanced experience with their care team. A formal evaluation was completed that included consumer interviews. And the consensus was that the consumer portal ensured that consumers received the right kind of treatment at the right time, which we were very proud of. That's fantastic. It's a great outcome. So great news. And now we'll move to the third person we'll be hearing from uh, tonight. So Sathya Rao, welcome. I'm Thank sorry, you. I should say, I'm going to ask you a question. That's right. Why are you so passionate about working with people who live with borderline personality disorder? Steve, thank you. Um, see, people with uh, borderline personality disorder are some of the nicest people I have met in my profession. And uh, I find them very, very forgiving. I tend to goof up things. I, I tend to make mistakes. They're very forgiving. And most of all, they get well all the time. And for a psychiatrist, that is extremely gratifying. That's great. And as you say, quite rare to have that degree of forgiveness and something to be treasured. So that's wonderful. And uh, people should know that Chloe is grinning like a Cheshire cat at that uh, at that thought of forgiving the psychiatrist, which is great. So we've got a good team tonight. We've got somebody with lived experience, an occupational therapist and um, a psychiatrist who specialises in this field. So it's going to be a good discussion and we'll make sure we leave plenty of time for um, your questions and for discussion between the panel members towards the end. I will just take you through the um, interface uh, just in case people are having problems with it already. Um, I think we're we're on a new system, Cloud, CrowdStrike or something. It's called. Sorry, it was a very, very bad joke. We've got a really robust system here and we won't be crashing. Everything will work really well, I'm sure. So with the web player, please make sure that you um, access the various resources. You can see the button down there in a handsome teal 
green color view supporting resources uh, you can also see where you complete the feedback survey on the way out but before we get there the supporting resources have got everything from the um the case study um items that the panelists thought you might get some benefits from as well as the slide deck that we're using tonight you can also see up the top right hand corner of your screen there um there's what's um, there is the stream chat with that speech bubble or top right hand corner Click on stream chat and you'll be able to join the group uh, and the chat discussion where there are people introducing themselves. Nadia is having a problem with sound, so me saying this won't help her, but there is unfortunately a sound icon you might have to click on to get the sound to work, but um, uh, she won't hear that. So if somebody might be able to text her that in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, if you do have tech support, there is a tech support button you can click to get help. But the very first thing is that if the webcast appears to have frozen for you, please try refreshing your browser. So highlighting and clicking enter and you'll reload the webcast and hopefully it'll all work again. Sometimes people's internet's a bit slow and the computer just gives up. So that's a good way to start. But if you can't get it going again, click on tech support to get some help. And that's in the top right hand corner up there near the, um, uh, the chat group. There it is. Uh, or tech, tech support next to the panellists um, mm -hmm. listing there. Now, with the uh, chat group, please make sure you uh, are respectful of um, each other, pa participants and the panellists, and keep comments on topic as much as you can. Uh, going off at a tangent can just be distracting for others who are trying to focus on what. If you can add to the conversation through the chat, that's fantastic. Now, what's happened tonight, we've got three panellists, which is a good number because it means that uh, we'll have plenty of time for conversation uh, towards the end of the webinar. Each panellist will give a short five-minute presentation about their discipline, and then it'll be followed by questions and answers between the panel. Um, the learning outcomes are there and you can see what they are. I won't read them because it does take time that we could be using. Uh, but the one I wanted to point out particularly is the third one. We want to look at how a multidisciplinary approach can support people living with um, borderline personality disorder uh, to better manage their feelings because um, when people feel they've been abandoned, that's not the case when there's a network of support uh, and people are often just moving further through the system. So we'll talk about that in some detail. I did want to uh, point out, though, uh, the disclaimer, which is really quite important. Tonight's about education. This, people are not speaking as clinicians or providing advice in this role. We're talking as educators, talking about clinical experience um, and personal experience, but not giving um, clinical advice. And if anybody does find the content um, distressing, because this does happen, we all have uh, issues that um, can be triggered sometimes by what's discussed. Please seek care from who you would normally seek care from, uh, your GP, local mental health practitioner or service or call Lifeline. But it's always important to look after yourselves. So hopefully the equipment's working. It seems to be, which is great. Uh, we will um, get on with the presentations. And most appropriately, we're going to start with Chloe. So please, Chloe, take it away. Um. Thank you, everyone. So, um, yeah, just wanted to start off with um, what it is to identify treatment strategies that support people living with BPD to better manage their feelings of rejection and fear of ab and abandonment. From a lived experience perspective, um, for me, clear communication was key. So often in my own mind, I'd be looking for evidence of fear of ab abandonment. So even simple things such as a text message with a full stop on the end, just having that full stop could trigger this fear. Um, or if someone went through a door and closed it behind them, to me, that was a, a sign of abandonment. So being very, very hyper alert and sensitive to all of these triggers. And sometimes I recognize it was very difficult for people to be able to 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 know what they'd actually done um so being able to unpack that after um to have a chat about it um so that there was clear communication oh i i, I put a full stop because um 
that's how I normally type messages. It's not because I I I don't like you or I wasn't interested in what you were saying or I wanted you to stop messaging. So these are just some of the things in terms of clarifying um, actions if there, there does seem to be a misunderstanding. Um, and also another strategy would be um, setting clear boundaries. So being able to negotiate, being able to talk to the person who with BPD who may be struggling with understanding what these boundaries are um, because there's always that element of, oh, I need to just make sure that they they really care. So if just say you've set a boundary that please don't call me after 10 p.m. at night, people may call at, you know, five past 10 just to make sure that, you really do care. Um, so, but but just re, um, confirming these boundaries and being able to follow through with these boundaries. So, you know, some it, it's hard sometimes, and you may say, "Oh, just let them talk; it's okay." But being able to say, "Hang on, um, I've mentioned that it's past ten o'clock now, so I won't be able to talk to you. How about you call tomorrow?" So, just being very clear with those things. Um, next slide, please. Now, in terms of identifying strategies to educate carers and families um, to better support people manage manage these this fear of abandonment and rejection, um, a key area is to approach the conversations at a, an appropriate time. So, just say the person with BPD was highly stressed out, like um, in this case study, if if the per, um, if Leah was very triggered, and then you try to reason with her, often it just doesn't doesn't go right at all, and it can end up getting worse. Um, so, just to wait till the person has cooled down, being able to reason with them. And often we do say to strike when the iron is cold. Um, so no, when things are heated, when the moment's hot, um, you know, just being able to know that that's probably not the best time um, to have a conversation. And then to be able to have that clear understanding and to be able to discuss what has happened with them um, and maybe to even set some boundaries. So, yes, people with BPD, they might push against the boundaries, but really these boundaries do keep them safe. There is an element of security when they they know what to expect with these boundaries. And um, another support is definitely empowerment. So within the mind of a person with BPD, there's just so much going on um, emotionally that they feel out of control. They often feel that, you know, they need to hold on to something. So being able to give them choice um, then empowers them so that, you know, in their own mind, emotionally, they may be out of control, but at least it gives them a bit of control with what's happening in terms of whether it's a conversation, whether it's where to meet somebody, um, just um, basic elements of control. Um, next slide, please. Now, moving on, this one's a very important one in terms of um, how I was supported as someone with BPD, um, the multidisciplinary approach. So with me, I had a case manager, but even within the case manager, there were other supports put in, such as having um, a peer worker. So throughout my supports, I did have a peer worker who I could talk to and just have those real life lived experience chats um, about mental health. Um, and also, you know, I also had a psychosocial worker to support me when things were um, difficult just to be able to get out um, uh, as well as I had a key clinician um, and MBT psychologist, um, as well as a second psychologist who didn't focus on MBT, but focus on other elements of recovery. Um, and look, having, being able, um, being part of the hospital system, um, it made it a lot easier because I didn't have to repeat my story again and again. So you can imagine that's one of the worst things when there's so much trauma already to then see a different person every time and repeat the story again. So just having that whole, um, whole team around the person, it's really like it takes a village to raise a child. It takes really a whole group of people to to be able to support someone with BPD um, and also being mindful so that not 
someone will not be have the entire responsibility so it's sort of a shared responsibility and in my care I was very fortunate to have the the team members support, um, speak to each other so I didn't have to pass notes I didn't have to send emails it was purely they were able to liaise with each other they had my case notes um, and yeah it was a very a very strong collective approach in terms of um, um, my care and my support and I found this highly beneficial official. Thank you. That's great, Chloe. Thanks. And it's just so good to hear you say about the timeliness of things being done, that there's real talent in the clinician and knowing when's the moment of opportunity, the chirotic moment to actually do something, and also the importance of the team communicating so that you're not always running over old territory, but you know that your story has been heard and absorbed by the team in that way. That's great. So thanks so much. We'll move straight to Zonia now, our occupational therapist, and hear your presentation. Thanks, Zonia. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. So planning your treatment sets a tone for how therapy will continue and how therapy will end. So the first step is to establish regular therapy sessions. A structured approach might be really difficult for Leah if we think of the case study. And so making other short times available throughout the week with a plan for when she is in distress will really assist Leah to work more effectively with her therapist. Initially, collaborating on identifying clear guidelines around therapeutic interaction, just like Chloe mentioned, and having them written down really assists in reducing ambiguity later on and is very helpful for both parties. The next thing I generally discuss in therapy is the use of a diary card to record incidents, emotional states, and the use of skills. This is set as an expectation early on as it assists with reflection and provides opportunities for validating a valid, therefore reinforcing skills that the person might use. Next slide, please. Fear of abandonment and the fear of rejection, in my experience, is prevalent in a large proportion of people with a borderline personality disorder. Generally, these symptoms do not become overly apparent in the first couple of sessions, but more evident as you attempt to build your therapeutic relationship. During the first couple of sessions, I generally focus on exploring self-defeating behaviours from an occupational perspective. Some of Leah's self-defeating behaviours include overworking to compensate for her fear of possible rejection and engaging in conversations with trolls online as she will um, eventually receive some negative feedback. I focus on exploring how much time is spent on these self-defeating behaviours and what planning is involved. Is there any patterns? And where does the environment support these behaviours? What is the emotional functionality of the self-defeating behaviours? And how does it form part of Leah's identity? This information is then initially addressed in individual therapy. And when Leah is ready, she's encouraged to attend group therapy sessions as it provides that opportunity for peer support that Chloe just mentioned that she valued as, um, as well. Next slide, please. Functional symptomology of someone with a fear of abandonment and or a fear of rejection, in my experience, is predominantly demonstrated in two ways during therapy. The person will either attempt to please the therapist, like Leah, as they want to avoid criticism from the therapist and possible rejection, or uh, the, a therapeutic relationship is hard to establish as they fear that the therapist might reject them and they tend to avoid the feeling of failure or abandonment. I've successfully implemented strategies for both of these groups. For the first group, we utilize targeted exposure um, in therapy. Their initial task is to not do an agreed upon task. For example, one day, maybe skip a diary entry or maybe even miss a session when there's a really good reason for it. Normalizing imperfection and the therapist's self-disclosure and some appropriate self-disclosures, really, around when therapists had to miss meetings, when we were sick, and how we actually uh, made up to address the situation afterwards really goes a far away. For the second group, I found that rather than spending therapy sessions talking and attempting to build a therapy relationship, that doing works better. Activities that the person with BPD finds interesting and value. For example, um, I've been shopping for a 
for food on a budget. I've gone for nature walks. I've gone through, oh, actually, I've gone to numerous coffees. This seems to really help to build a bridge between the person living with BPD and the therapist. Next slide, please. Ending therapy is hard for people with a fear of abandonment and may be perceived as a rejection. So I tend to not end therapy. Or at the very least, I don't use the word ending or termination or concluding. I just validate how well people are doing and say that we need to now test how they would go without regular therapy. I then reduce therapy session in collaboration with the person with personality disorder and I ask them to schedule a therapy session when they need it. This last step is really hard for people and the planning that you did in the beginning of therapy around safety is looked at again in detail before you, you start this process. Next um, slide, please. Normalizing that relationship up, relationships are tough and that the fear of abandonment and rejection will further complicate relationship with carers and families is a good place to commence interactions with Leah and her family. In my experience, it is better to not linger too much on why Leah have an anxious attachment style in sessions with her family, but rather where to from here. So incorporating family and carers into Leah's treatment plan can enhance her engagement, progress, and overall well-being. This includes education and training of Leah and her family, discussing daily routine planning and the importance of a balanced lifestyle strategies to enhance communication and collaboration and doing something fun together always seems to work well. I will attempt to incorporate, I always intend to incorporate carers and families throughout the treatment as much as I can. I hope that I noted some new ideas or just validated what effective therapy looks like for people with a fear of abandonment and a re rejection. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much indeed, Zonia. I can see that people found a lot in your presentation, so that's great. It's a shame we have to compress everything into these uh, few minutes, but um, we can explore your themes more fully in the uh, in the discussion that's coming up. I'm particularly interested in going for a walk with your clients. That sounds like a mutually beneficial uh, thing to do. Um, and now the third presentation uh, from Sathya. Thank you very much, Sathya. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh... Thank you, Zonia, for that very nice presentation. And uh, Chloe, uh, I really want to thank you for your generosity in sharing your information. Uh, I put this slide to demonstrate that um, uh, the feelings of rejection, loneliness, uh, hypersensitivity in interpersonal relationships, and fear of abandonment are all uh, quite interrelated. They all tend to overlap on each other, and sometimes uh, when people experience uh, many of those feelings together, um, that can uh, be extremely painful psychologically. And uh, that is something which our uh, case vignette shows. And one can uh, think in terms of giving up life. So I just want to caution all of us that these symptoms should not be taken lightly. These are extremely painful thoughts and emotions. Next slide, please. And uh, interpersonal hypersensitivity, uh, emotion dysregulations, and rejection sensitivity, uh, they all can lead to fear of abandonment, and fear of abandonment can lead to all of them. Uh, just the interrelationships I wanted to uh, um, exemplify. And the loneliness, of course. Thank you. Next slide, please, Steve. So what are the possible causes of fear of abandonment and uh, rejection sensitivity? There are biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. Of the biological factors, one can actually inherit a kind of brain, the emotional system, uh, that can predispose somebody to develop a fear of abandonment emotional dynamics. Also, there are, now there are some studies, to uh, early studies, trying to uh, hypothesize that uh, fear of abandonment can sometimes be hardwired in people because if they've had very early experiences during their childhood, uh, for example, in our uh, case vignette, Leah's mother had postnatal depression. Leah's mother was a migrant. She was unable to uh, 
provide adequate uh, uh, time and attention uh, for a daughter so those sort of very early experiences can get sometimes can get hardwired in the brain also sometimes these experiences can take an addictive quality uh, one can get used to it so much of course the psychological factors are some of the most important ones which is the attachment difficulties the early childhood experiences as i mentioned and if one is uh, abandoned as a child one experiences the feelings of abandonment as a child that can again predispose a person to uh, fear of ab abandonment in adulthood of course the childhood trauma factors uh, feelings of identity lessness and uh, fear of aloneness they all can lead to uh, fear of abandonment thank you next slide please these are some of the examples of uh, triggers for fear of abandonment uh, chloe very nicely uh, articulated and gave the example of how even a full stop at the end of the text message or a door being closed can actually uh, trigger fear of abandonment these are other things the discharge from the hospitals commonly triggers fear of abandonment uh, termination of therapy or end of therapy as uh, our other panelist zonia highlighted a therapist going on leave uh, can trigger or therapist cancelling appointments uh, if they are in a weekly uh, uh, therapeutic schedule or when receiving negative feedback at workplace can also trigger fear of abandonment sometimes the fear of a uh, fear of rejection can be real or perceived rejections it doesn't have to be even if it is uh, perceived that can lead to significant uh, fear of abandonment thank you next slide please so some of the ways people with people uh, with the experience of fever fear of abandonment can manifest their symptoms is feeling lonely or fear of being alone and emotions getting uh, dysregulated feeling angry or sometimes in family violence uh, situations uh, a partner might uh, stay in the relationship despite that being dysfunctional because of the fear of abandonment uh of course it can trigger impulsivity self injury and suicidal behaviors and also sometimes idealization devaluation responses and sometimes people can feel a bit uh too attached uh what is sometimes referred to as clinging uh that again is the manifestation of fear of abandonment and it it can also at its extreme can lead to dissociations and microsychotic episodes next slide please so what do we do how can we help people uh, uh with experience of fear of abandonment zonia and chloe have already highlighted uh, some of the uh, ways we can approach uh, education is the key i think chloe you highlighted that very well education regarding fear of abandonment and uh, so person with the with the experience need to know what what it, what it is that they're experiencing and become more and more aware of it once they become aware of it we can teach them uh, skills to uh, change it and modify it and zonia spoke about how modeling can help you know some you don't need to be a perfect therapist uh, sometimes do, doing uh, appropriate self disclosure can actually be very helpful for a person who is experiencing this uh, phenomena and uh, the uh, psychological therapies all the evidence based ones such as dialectic behavior therapy mentalization based treatments are all very effective and uh, a swiss group have actually developed a specific therapy called the abandonment therapy um, and uh, they they published a paper around that um and uh, see mindfulness strategies again can be quite helpful uh, rarely uh medicine such as specific serotonin reuptake inhibitors that's the example is sertraline or escitalopram kind of medications can be helpful if someone is experiencing severe severe uh, rejection sensitivity in some cases of course there's not much of evidence towards that next slide please so this i'm not going to go through the slide there's just a slide i put to give few more examples uh, to add to what uh, chloe uh, highlighted some of the descriptions people provide when they're experiencing fear of abandonment like saying that you are you are not there for me or no one likes me anymore i know i'll be alone eventually these are some of the thoughts triggered by fear of abandonment thank you thank you so much seth and so and thank you all for being so concise uh, we've got plenty of time now for conversation um a good 
uh, 40 minutes or so. So this will be fantastic. But I'm going to start by going back to Chloe. Chloe, you mentioned when you were presenting and judging by what people have been saying in the chat room, you really hit the spot with what people were hoping to hear. But you mentioned the range of people who surround you. And I guess that's professional and personal people around you. Can you can you tell us a bit more about that sort of cloud of support around you? What Who's in there? Um, for me, I did make a choice that I didn't want my family to be involved in my care. I know that with a lot of people with BPD, they do have people, family to support them. So for me, um, because I lived in a different state to my family, um, I did end up having a lot of professional supports um, and really they worked together seamlessly um, so that I, I felt I was supported in every way. Um, so, for example, even when um, I did choose to be discharged from case management, um, it was a very supported um, transition where there was a lot of um, interaction with my GP so that um, even just say with any medication or anything, um, the same sort of supports were in place. So, um to this day, I've never seen a script. I've never had to deal with any medication. It goes straight to the pharmacy. The pharmacy delivers it to my house. Um, I've never had to deal with any of that. Um, and that was just support that was ongoing from case management to my GP, who was then willing um, to follow through with that. Um, and Apart from that, some other creative supports as well. So I did actually attend um, DBT art therapy with a registered um, art therapist, and that was really helpful as well. So despite having, you know, two psychologists who worked on different things, I had a key clinician, a psychosocial worker, who then was able to link me in with community supports um, in terms of um, exercise groups and things like that. And it, it was really, really helpful in my care. Um, and, yeah, this a lot of this was supported uh, and done through case management where they were able to liaise with specialists um, and also having the referrals to park services, so prevention and recovery services. Um, that was really, really helpful because I know from my own lived experience, hospitals were not the best place. They weren't really conducive for my recovery. I'm not saying that's for everyone, but for me. Um, so uh, whereas going into a recovery centre was far more beneficial where you could work on recovery goals. There was um there was a lot of empowerment. There was it was voluntary. So if you didn't want to be there, you could walk out any day. Um, so yeah, just having those supports in place. And even with the recovery centers, um, there were a lot of timed um, um and supported referrals there where just say I had a, a difficult anniversary coming up or a difficult time, my case manager would then put in the referral for a prevention and recovery um, centre stay. And look, sometimes the, the the shortest stay I've had was two weeks, but the longest did end up being about six weeks. And yeah, I think it, they, it was really, really important in terms of my recovery. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for that response, Chloe. It was really, uh, really helpful. I'm just wondering whether um, Zonia or Sathya wanted to comment on what Chloe's said. In my experience, that's exactly the same. If we form a really good multidisciplinary team around the person, with the person being in the centre and kind of directing us in terms of what is their preferences, that works really well towards helping them recover. It's really providing that kind of right treatment at the right time um, and from the right person as well because our skill sets are so different. Sasha will have a different skill set than my skill set and it's leveraging of those as much as possible. Right. Thanks so much. Sathya, I'm not sure what you look like you were going I, to say. I just want to echo what Zonia said. Uh, I think working together in a multidisciplinary team is uh, very vital, especially because we, we all are going to take leave, we all might change jobs, and if there is a group of us working together, at least one or two people can hold the therapeutic relationship in the long term. 
So otherwise, if people, everybody leaves, we are again creating abandonment for the client. Excellent. Now, I realize I didn't give an instruction about asking how to ask questions. People have figured it out from what was on the bottom of the screen anyway, and a number of questions have already come through um, from uh, through the question portal. But if you did want to ask a question, the best way to do it is to hover over the lower part of the screen again. You'll see the three little dots over there in the far right-hand corner, and then click on Ask a Question, and then it comes through uh, onto the proper portal. But I'm going to pick up a question out of the chat box because it's quite interesting. Lots of interesting questions in the chat box. This is from... Um, Therese Ballard, who's asked, could the presenters speak to a phrase that uh, therapists sometimes hear, I can't or I won't be able to take care of myself uh, in that situation? Um, and um, also, which I guess could be called learned helplessness, maybe not, but also about identitylessness and how to strengthen people's sense of self. So... I don't know. Satya, are you best to start off with that one? Are you happy to say a few things about that question from Therese? Yep. Um, so first of all, the, the it's a very common phrase uh, that I hear that uh, that I can't take I, I can't or I won't be able to take care of myself. I think the first response I would suggest us clinicians to make is that uh, validate it. Because that's the experience people with borderline personality disorder have. And can you imagine how difficult that is and how painful it is going to be for the person to actually feel that they can't look after themselves, right? So first is to validate and understand, unpack that statement a lot more as to what do you mean by that? What are the things you can't look after yourself? And is that a feeling you feel at times? Where, or is it there all the time? Or do you? So going through all of that, and then gradually trying to work with them to re make them realize that they have been looking after themselves until now. Um, maybe, and it has been very challenging, very, with, with great deal of difficulty, and trying to show their strengths and, and working with that on a regular basis over and over and over a period of time. So that's one of, that's one of the simple approaches to uh, start with that. Uh, and that learned helplessness is a real real feeling. That's, that's their experience. And also trying to find out when did they start feeling like this, you know, trying to look at the antecedents and the origins of those thoughts and feelings. The second part is identity lessness. Uh, this is a phrase that was used by uh, one of the researchers in, in the field. And what it talks about is the again the 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 the, the emotion or the feeling or the thought that uh, people with borderline personality disorder have that they don't know who they are. And uh, they often and even if they know they're not comfortable with who they are, and they tend to uh, Look, of, look at others' behaviors and uh, thoughts and feelings and personalities and tend to copy that and mimic that at times. So again, so very similar principles, trying to validate who they actually are. Even if they say that, look, I don't know who I am, but that's the person you are then. And starting with wherever they are and then trying to work through. Right. Thank you. What are your thoughts, Chloe? Um, from a lived experience point of view, I do echo a lot of what um, Safia has mentioned um, in terms of the validation, just to know that that person's hearing. Um, and what worked for me with case management and with my psychologist is that they knew me so well that they knew exactly when to pull out the card and really challenge me. So sometimes they'd say, okay, you can't do it. What's the worst that can happen? So I'd sometimes be taken aback. You're supposed to understand me and now you're asking me what's the worst that can happen. So it's just being able to learn to reframe what I, I was saying um, and, yeah, just having that modelling from um, the my therapist. Um, so you're saying that, that you can't look after yourself. So um, as, you, as Sathya said, mentioned in the past so you've been able to do this 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 so now let's reframe this so you don't think you can look after yourself in this circumstance but you are able to look after yourself so being able to model that language um and 
repeating it so that we can then be able to use some of that language and just really start to do a lot of self-talk and start thinking, oh, okay, maybe I can. So yeah, just being able to be supported that way. But yeah, just being able uh, for clinicians to know the person well enough to know ex exactly what the need is at that time and when. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chloe. Zonia, what's your take on this? I think mine is very similar to Sathya and Chloe. Um, I've heard it a lot. I feel empty. I don't feel like I've got an identity. I think part of our role as a therapist too is when somebody is sitting in therapy, I remind them that you you already here today, right? So you've already made one choice. This one choice forms part of your identity. Our identity is, is just a lot of choices. It's what our values are. It is uh, what our interests are. And from our occupation, therapist perspective helping people to explore that so what what is the doing that you like to do um you know what is the things that you like to do with family and friends or on your own what is your values and you know using things like values cards and all those kind of things really help the person to to get to know themselves but also to form that therapeutic relationship with me as a therapist and this is where i share a lot of things as well is that your identity can change you know i might like us i might fried eggs today tomorrow i like scrambled eggs right it's part of my identity and that's how i develop so I think it is um, it is taking it one day at a time and validating what people have achieved. But like Chloe also said, challenging if people are bringing up these kind of thoughts of emptiness and saying that, all right, well, what does it actually mean that you feel empty? Is it loneliness? Is that something we're going to work with? Is it maybe the connection that you don't feel with other people that we need to work with? And really exploring those kind of themes. Right. Well, I think we've learned a lot from that conversation. Any final comment from you, Sathya, or we'll move to another question? Uh, just, uh, um, just want to unpack a little bit more of what Chloe and Sonia have said. It is important to gently challenge them and make them realize that they have been able to look after themselves, etc. Word of caution, because first validate 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 and validate because if we quickly move on to challenging that can backfire very badly because then you're saying you're calling the person bluff you're actually not understanding the feeling of the person so just being very careful and finding the right time to start challenging and that is after plenty of validation when you have a good relationship with the with the person the the next question uh, you asked, Steve, is about the uh, real loss, whether that can actually trigger fear of abandonment. Absolutely, yes. I'm sure all of us have experienced that in our lives. However, what seems to happen with people with borderline personality disorder is that it seems to have happened very earlier on in their life, usually within the first five to ten years. That tends to get a, a, a develop a, a, a live, a, a live a real imprint on the developing brain which can set the stage later on for lots and lots of triggers uh, so a single abandon single loss can certainly trigger but usually it is multiple losses childhood experiences that leads to fear of abandonment uh, in the adult in a person with bodily personality disorder So thank you for exploring that with us. I think you've actually uh, dealt with that question exceptionally well. But I wanted to move to one now that's come from um, Jennifer Manson, uh, who was asked, and I'll put it in the chat there, does the fear of abandonment sometimes result as a real loss of someone important? I guess that goes to the case study where poor old, what's his name, Damien, has um, gone. Uh, is this... Uh, What's your approach when there has actually been a genuine abandonment? Is there something different? And I'm including you in this, Chloe, because if you work with younger people particularly who must experience this, but um, who would like to start us off with a bit of a discussion about what happens when there actually has been a genuine abandonment in the person's life and what approach you take? I'm happy to start the conversation. Um, right, so I feel... Our job as therapists is to help our 
um, consumers, clients, patients really experience their emotions when they're ready. And this is really tough. This is tough for us as anybody. It's tough, right, to experience that. And I think validating that. But we also need to understand that um, we need to grieve and we need to actually experience those emotions in a in a functional way. So sitting with that, sitting with that discomfort sometimes is really, really tough. So working with the person living with a borderline personality disorder works well, I think, if we actually go, that is fine to experience those emotions. There's no good and no bad emotions. We are humans and we experience all those emotions that goes with loss and with grief and that it is hard. And there's no shame of one day choosing to be miserable or two days choosing to be miserable. Um, that is perfectly fine. And all of us go through that. And then it is standing up on the other side and continuing. And I think that's the bit that we can help people with is, is carrying them and hope, hold, holding the hope for them when they don't have it themselves. Thanks. Any other comments about that? Uh, I think that was beautifully explained by Zonia. Thank you. Uh, if there is a real loss, people are going to feel grief and grief and loss experiences, as Zonia uh, very nicely illustrated. And uh, that is a normal emotion. We want to uh, help the person grieve adequately. And if that gets prolonged for a long period of time, or if the triggers excessive emotions, which is experienced as being very painful for the person. And uh, if take, that is, if it takes on other added qualities, or if the person starts uh, thinking and feeling that no one will ever uh, is, is going to be with me, everybody is going to leave me, etc., etc. You know, can you see the added on qualities? If that happens, then you would want to, or if that takes on the proportion of, you know, self-injury, self-harm, uh, then you would want to work with that. But that's a very uh, skillful work. You want to validate the grief and you'd want to gently also work with the uh, add-ons. And as Zonia said, you need to give a little bit of time for the normal grief to process and the other complicated grief which comes on later on needs to be worked with. Right. All right. Well, there's actually, I've just been a bit um, keeping an eye on the chat box. There's quite a lot going on there with people talking about what about um, comorbidities or other diagnoses, and particularly ADHD. People have also mentioned PTSD. And they're wondering, particularly in the way the case study is presented, whether um, it could be uh, that um, ADHD would need to be considered for Leia and Leia, I'm just wondering what people think about teasing apart the diagnosis. What what's people's strategy for there? Because there's been a lot of questions about that. Looks like you're in the hot seat, Seth. Uh, happy to start, uh, Steve. Uh, yeah. Look, uh, a post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, PTSD is a very common co-occurrence with Berlin personality disorder. Nearly 50 to 60 percent of the people will have. Uh, PTSD. And if you're looking at complex PTSD, again, half of the people with borderline personality disorder will have, will have complex PTSD. Now, whether um, our uh, client now, uh, whether she has a, a PTSD or not, there's, there's some information to support that, but not there's not a whole lot of information. So to say it is PTSD, they need to have, first of all, reoccurrence phenomena, flashbacks, nightmares, avoidance behaviors, hypervigilance, et cetera, et cetera. They're all set of set criteria needs to be there. And the person needs to experience the trauma, either uh, uh, childhood sexual abuse or uh, adult traumas where the person's life is under threat. So we don't have a whole lot of information to make a diagnosis of PTSD, but it's a worthwhile differential diagnosis to consider and explore in, uh, in the future. ADHD, again, uh, is not uncommon in people with borderline personality disorder. About 20 to 30 percent of the people will have co-occurring ADHD, and uh, whether the uh, Leah also has ADHD, again, I would consider it as a differential diagnosis. Right now, there is not a whole lot of information. Commonly, if there is adult ADHD, they would have had childhood ADHD, and there would have been signs and symptoms. Again, we don't have information towards that, but one needs to keep an eye. 
uh, to explore into the future if that if she does have adhd treat her with uh, stimulants if required or with psychological strategies as appropriate one more thing to remember is that uh, childhood adhd is a very significant risk factor for adult borderline personality disorder hey thank you zoni did you want to add to that further um oh at maybe just one thing is that um whatever the diagnosis is and um you know ot's generally don't work on a diagnosis we work on symptomology yeah. so really we would look at what is the functional impairment that leo is demonstrating to us for uh, to us and we will work within that and i think the five functions of treatment from my perspective is here is to really improve leo's motivation to work towards her recovery to enhance her capabilities to practice her skills that might be if she's ADHD, adhd pdsd Uh, BPD to really make sure that her environment and her family supports her, um, and that um, you know she's effect she works to effectively towards the goals that she has identified. So, from my perspective, I work on functioning, not as much on diagnosis. That makes a lot of sense, and I think that's where the complementary team really comes into its own by taking those different approaches and. Uh, just noticing somebody in the group talking about the sensitivity of people with ADHD and that, that might be something that the occupational therapist could help with i guess to try to modify the environment so that it's not quite so overwhelming for people okay um i'm absolutely fascinated by this comment that uh, has come from Who am I going to dob in for making it's a great comment? Um, it's Amanda. Amanda Clayton uh, has made the comment that after reading the case notes, the first thing that occurred to her was the need to gently encourage Leia to acknowledge what she does well and develop an acknowledging and compassionate inner adult. What does our panel think? So I guess maybe it's back to you, Zonia, and then if Chloe or Sethi wanted to jump in. I would definitely start with validating that. Leah has done extremely well with different areas of her life. She comes from a cultural background where it is tough and I think she's managed that and navigated that um, complex situation really well. She's doing well at work. So there's heaps of things that we can validate and that's what Sathya said from the beginning. We validate, validate, validate before we start challenging um, and we make sure that those validations um, help us enhance our therapeutic relationship. Um, I'm not sure about the compassionate inner adult. I'm not sure about that language, but definitely um, from my perspective, offering her a lot of compassion of what she's gone through. And I think that um, she's doing really well in certain areas. Any other comment from the panel about that? Chloe, do you want to say anything before I... Um... Yes, I do. So um, based on this comment, I do actually agree with, you know, having that that person-centered approach, um, being able to acknowledge the strengths of that person, um, even for myself, because after, you know, 10 years or something for myself where we, I really, really struggled to see the world through anything but a so-called negative lens or a very dark lens, it was very hard to see the good in myself. So there was a lot of self-blame that I'm faulty. I'm an, I remember the comment that I often made that there's innately something wrong with me because personality disorder, there's something wrong with my personality. So even from the very foundation, just to be, just for someone to support um, and, and acknowledge the strengths of the person, it was really, really helpful. It didn't mean I acknowledged it straight away, but the more it was repeated and repeated and repeated, um, then, then I thought, oh, maybe there is something good about me because for me, it took many, many years before I was able to get support and really take off those negative lenses um, to be able to see things for what they were worth. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Sathya, are you tensing yourself to speak? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to again um, uh, echo what Sonia said, that uh, when, when someone has self-critical thoughts and self-loathing feelings the common tendency of clinicians is to disagree and uh, 
challenge and say no 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 you're really good you're really good at this uh, that is experienced as invalidation by the person because they don't actually feel it and and you are actually trying to say that they they what they are experiencing is not right so first is to as zonia said gently validate but not validate too much you might say something like so given what you're going through i can sort of understand why you have these feelings why you would want to why you would blame yourself you know then trying to link it up with the development trajectory so that it takes away the blame uh, for even feelings having self loathing thoughts they can self loathe so trying to ge- be very gentle and try and validate that first and then trying to ask uh, very gradually working through because sometimes we can get a bit too enthusiastic and look at self compassion therapy um, that can again be very very hard for people with borderline personality disorder with this thoughts to exp- uh, undergo so very gradual uh, comp- showing compassion us showing compassion and checking in with them is that hard for you if i show compassion and then getting them to gradually work with their with their own self compassion thoughts and given the the kind of harsh parenting uh, potentially she said of course my may have been culturally appropriate but that is like she was likely to have interjected those sort of uh, emotions and feeling that also gives a clue that probably she has ptsd thanks so you know i'm going to pick up on your discussion of compassion there and take a question from tyson rosoli rotoli and there's actually been a few along these lines as well um and tyson's asked how can you help patients build resilience and a stronger self of sense of self worth um to counteract feelings of abandonment what are people's thoughts about that is that something that you would consider zonia or, or chloe um yes i can talk to this speak to this um so what i've noticed with in mental health a lot of people are looking for quick results um for me it took years of therapy very targeted therapy um to to be able to change those unhelpful patterns of thinking so for me myself i i often think it's taken me you know 20 something years to build up this way of thinking you cannot expect someone to change overnight it takes a lot of time a lot of work um to be able to counteract those feelings and then to be able to really see the face value of what things are um so yeah i think you know a lot of patience it takes it's not something that will happen immediately it takes a lot of time a lot of um emphasis a lot of repetition um to be able to help the person be able to gradually change the their patterns of thinking to a way that is more helpful and helps them function in life thank you thank you We've got time for a couple more questions and there was one that's come up a number of times which is about this condition at um extremes of not extremes of life but later in life and early in life. I know Chloe you work with children. I'm just wondering with the others. Uh there's been a question um from uh Philip uh who has asked would you please be able to comment on the prevalence of mature age people experiencing the onset of BPD symptoms and how this can be triggered and can this be triggered by real life events such as divorce or death of a partner or, or things like that is that something that people are familiar with as some um, therapists you're nodding let's let's hear what you've got to say what do what are your thoughts about that about what happens later in life any different approaches uh you're asking Zonia or Chloe or myself. Well, I'll ask you, Sathya. I guess you and I represent the older generation. What uh, What are your thoughts about what happens when somebody has um, a, an issue in their yeah. um, life that might trigger this? I think I think Zonia's frozen on our screen, so it looks like you're in the hot seat. Uh, it's a, this is something which has come up in the last ten years for us, and um, we find at Spectrum where I work. a third of all the people who uh, access our services tend to be people who, who are in the middle ages and they've often not had 
any diagnosis of BPD so far. And uh, but they've had the childhood risk factors and some situations trauma factors. But throughout their life, they've been fine without any symptoms. But when um, our hypothesis is that they did not develop the symptoms because either a long-term relationship or a stable job has sort of been a protective factor and uh, and did not they, they would have still experienced psychological distress probably they did not have symptoms to make a diagnosis however if they if there is a relationship loss or a loss of a job or sometimes in older age when they go to the nursing home or when they retire these are all the factors which can actually trigger and and uh, people can come up with borderline personality disorder for the first time. We have worked with someone who is 78 years old coming with borderline personality disorder for the first time. So it's 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 now uh, well known. We don't know the prevalence yet though. There's no good studies to show that. But we did a, a survey of uh, old age uh, mental health clinicians in Victoria and they said that 10% of all their patients uh, in older age tended to have borderline personality disorder. Okay. Well, thank you. I think that's really answered that question. We're getting to the time now where we need to start moving into final comments. Please stay with us, everybody in the audience. There is a question, though, which has come up for a number of people, both in the chat group and also in the questions. What does recovery look like? And Zonia, I might go to you first of all. What what does recovery for for somebody look like as somebody with BPD? I think from my perspective, recovery is somebody functioning well within their community, within their friend group, within their family group, and it's them meeting the goals that they want to to achieve. And um, we have people who their recovery looked like not self-harming for a period and being able to get tattoos on that self-harming area. And that was their recovery. Then we've had people who became peer workers. We became we had people who became nurses within our mental health unit. So I think in the end of the day, recovery looks different for everyone. Um, and I think that's an individualized journey. But from my perspective, it is when people can function at the level that they want to function and achieve the goals that they want to achieve. And I'm not saying that recovery is ever going to be without any bumps in the road. We all have bumps in the road, and I think that's really important to note. And um, we talk about that quite openly, that as a therapist, I have to do daily mindfulness, daily self-care, make sure I live a balanced life, go to the gym. You know, I need to do things to make sure that I stay well. Um, and so that's the same for people with BPD. Right. Thanks. And Chloe, there's a comment in the chat saying that you sound like a powerful woman. Well done you with our world currently being very dependent on a powerful woman. Uh, this is um, a very timely question to ask you. What does recovery look like? Uh, from my own experiences, I have never said to anybody I have recovered from BBD. Um, I myself see recovery as a lifelong process um however i do see that i've recovered to the point where it doesn't affect my daily functioning and that's the point where i say yes i've still got plenty of things to work from work on and i don't think i have recovered but i can now function and be able to you know have my my goals and um what I'd like to achieve fulfilled um, because of the recovery that I have experienced. So, yeah, I'm not sure if I would ever say that I have recovered um, and I do to this day see recovery as a lifelong process. Okay. Yeah, people have said it's not linear in the chat and you think you've made that very clear to us. It's not just not that simple, is it? But uh, as, actually, Satya, from the psychiatry perspective, what's your view of recovery? What does that mean for somebody with BPD? See, unfortunately, recovery is a, medi is, is a phrase taken from the medical model. Uh, it doesn't really lend itself very well uh, for people with borderline personality disorder. So we want to individualize, as Zonia said, define with the client what recovery might mean for that person. 
Um, so that's what we want to work with. There is some research uh, which has been done from both uh, New South Wales as well as from Spectrum. Uh, we have actually worked with the clients and to articulate what recovery might mean. A uh, word of caution, we don't want to change people's personality. People with borderline personality disorder have vibrant personalities, bright personalities. And we don't want to change that. We don't want to work. <laughs> we don't want to retain that and foster that. What is not working for them is what we want to change. Help them change. Thanks, Sathya. And I always feel the sense of grief when we get to this part of the evening and there are so many great questions still to be asked. Uh, and we will share those questions with the panellists so they know exactly what people have been interested in. A lot of it's been covered um, as the presentations and the conversations gone on, but there's still plenty to talk about. Please stay with us, everybody. We've got 10 minutes to go, and in these final 10 minutes, we'll hear from each of our panellists just saying a few final words about the topic and um, what they've heard from people. Um, again... Chloe, I can't help but look at the chat box and see Isabel saying you're an inspiration and a representation of hope. So with that lead in, what are your final thoughts on the on the topic? Um, for people out there, people working with people with borderline personality disorder, with fear of abandonment, there is a lot of unpredictability, but please know that the person is hurting. Um as much as it's hurting people around them, consider how much the person themselves is hurting and hence this is why we see these behaviours. There is so much emotional emotional hurt within them um, that they can't help but, be able, but try and take control of what they have around them. Um, and, yeah, just being really curious about what's happening. Um, so often I do say be curious before furious. Um, so it's not okay, uh, that reactive approach. It's more about having that that proactive approach where we preempt things that are going to happen and we build sort of um, supports in place so that we don't wait until there is a very heightened moment before we try and put things in place. So, yeah, just being able to listen to the person and having that patience as well. This, As I've said before, recovery doesn't happen with BPD overnight. It doesn't get so-called fixed with a tablet. Um, it doesn't get fixed with, you know, a week a week therapy. Um, it takes a lot of time to change those patterns of thinking that haven't been working. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's a lot of commitment on both sides. Um, but knowing this, the person themselves has to be ready we can't impose therapy on someone with BPD because it is a very active process. And if the person's not ready and there's no buy-in, it makes it really, really difficult. And pretty much you're battling against something that's it's it's not going to happen. So they're really my last words to leave with everybody that, you know, that compassion towards somebody who is in a lot of pain, a lot of emotional pain. It's not so much physical pain, but the emotional pain can be close to unbearable for the person in every aspect of life. Thank you, Thanks. Steve. Thanks, Chloe. That's such important words. And I'm going to get cards printed up with be curious before furious because it's actually something we try and teach GPs, that if somebody is challenging you as a patient, be curious about what that means and don't get angry, get interested um, and uh, uh, it was interesting the last time we had one of these presentations that GP colleagues said to me that they actually like people with um, borderline personality disorder coming into their surgeries because they're engaging and it's interesting and, you know, you you come off autopilot. Anyway, that's my pit. Zonia, take over, please. What are your final thoughts about tonight? Well, I don't have a slogan, so I need to really think quickly now. But from my uh, my take home messages is that um, the relationship is really the key and should be our first focus. Collaboration works best, and this is a relationship between equals. We no longer have the therapist sitting on the chair and the patient lying on the couch. It's a relationship between equals. We work together. I think one of the most beautiful stories I've heard is from a therapist perspective um, and a person living with borderline personality perspective is we're two people 
both rowing in a boat, right? We're both rowing in the same direction. The person with borderline personality disorder is sitting in the front. They are they are steering. They are providing the direction. So what from a therapist's point of view is I'm rowing as hard as that person is rowing. What we sometimes do have is that the person in front is drilling little holes in the boat. Um, and that is, you know, we need to acknowledge that and we need to get some water out, fill those holes, but keep on rowing. And I think that's the most beautiful thing that I've heard, um, you know, from a therapist perspective. I think the other thing is that self-disclosure, appropriate self-disclosure, like Satya said, is really important. And that, like Chloe said, recovery is not an end goal. It's a lifelong journey. And I think that's, that's really important. I think the last thing I just might say is from a therapist's point of view, is supervision is really, really important. Make sure you get robust and frequent supervision. Um, well, for, for a couple of reasons, but one reason is really to make sure that you provide the best care that you possibly can for people living with personality disorder. But I think the other one is to make sure that you stay well as well as a therapist, because there's not a lot of people out there um, at the minute that provide, um, that wants to take on people with borderline personality disorder, which I don't understand because it's part of, it's my favorite part of my role, but it is something that we do need to um, think of. That is so important, Zonia. It was such, you guys are such a valuable, limited resource. There's been conversation in the chat about how hard it is to find therapists um, and access them. So keeping healthy is really important as well. And remembering that it's not just a little robot, it's a racing eight to have an Olympic strategy. You've got lots of other people in the team who can convey that coxswain to their best living. So it's really important to make sure that everybody's pulling together in the same direction. I've milked that analogy as far as it's going and then a little bit more. Satya, what are your final thoughts before we wrap up? Thanks, Dave. Uh, my first take-home message is that uh, people with bodily personality disorder do improve and do recover all the time. And we just need to change our nihilistic sort of viewpoint about this. The second take-home message I want to convey is that you don't have to be a perfect therapist. You can't be. In fact, it fails if you, if you try to be. You just need to be a good enough therapist. You just need to do a good enough job. If you remember what I said earlier on that, you know, people with borderline personality disorder are most forgiving. Um, in fact, if you're a good enough therapist, and because if you try to be heroic and you want to do heroic things, it is not going to work. And also, it is, you're going to burn out very quickly. You just need to be yourself and do a good enough job and take care about a few things. And uh, that seems to work. And now the research shows that... Uh, uh, what is the most juicy bit in all those evidence-based psychological treatments, dialectical behavior therapy, mentalization-based treatments, so on and so forth? The most important aspect of all of those treatments is what Zonia said, therapeutic relationship. Therapeutic relationship accounts for 50% of the outcome. So if you're, if you're a good enough therapist and manage your therapeutic relationship, you can go a long, long way in helping a person with borderline personality disorder. You don't have to have extensive training in all the specialist therapists to work with people with borderline personality disorder. I would highly encourage you to work. And as I said, my professional satisfaction has been great working with people with borderline personality disorder. Thank you. Fantastic, Ceci. Thank you. I think you've reminded us to be who we are and be curious and not spurious, maybe. Maybe that's another set of cards I'll need to get printed up. I'm, I'm getting T-shirts made. I thought that was just brilliant. So thank you all so much. And um, I must say, I've not seen such an active chat with people being so grateful to what's been shared tonight. Um, obviously, the very personal viewpoint from Chloe and the highly skilled um, viewpoints from um, Satya and Zonia. So thank you. That's been great. We do have a few things to finish up with, and people, please don't leave before you've done the um, feedback survey. You can see, that again, that lovely teal-coloured button down the bottom there, complete feedback survey, so please do that before you go. So a few other things just to talk about before we uh, finish up, and uh, the first of those is to um, remind you there's another webinar coming up on the 9th of September. Um, which is how to apply the principles of mentalization-based therapy in your practice. 
uh, um, with people who have borderline personality disorders. So that'll be interesting to find out more about mentalization um, based therapy. There's a podcast, uh, which are a great way of uh, making a trip pass. This is about journalism and mental health. It's a conversation about that. Um, so please look for MHPN Presents in your preferred, pod preferred podcast app. Just there next to this, the rest is history and Hamish and Andy. It'll be there. You'll find it. Top rating. Um, MHPN also supports more than 300 networks where mental health practitioners meet, both online and in person, to engage in free interdisciplinary networking. And again, that network is so important, vital. Peer support, again, vital. And also CPD, um, like tonight, and you will get your certificates. If you're interested in finding out more, then please go to mhpn.org.au. Now, don't forget, coming up 1st of um, October is BPD Awareness Week, uh, and that's focused on living life well. Uh, for further information on events in your state, please visit the BPD Awareness uh, website, which is included in the webinar supporting resources, um, that button down the bottom of the screen there. So thank you for participating in tonight's webinar. Thank you to our three fabulous panellists. Please complete the survey. Either click on that um, QR code you can see on the screen there, we all love those, um, or click the button for completing feedback survey. Can't be easy, but please do. It's really important to us. The statements of attendance for UCPD will be on the portal in two weeks, and the recording, which is entire, and also uh, can be accessed with um, uh, transcript, um, will be available in one week. So it's 8.30, time to close. Before I close, or 8.30 on the East Coast, I should say, before I close, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to everyone on the screen and also at their keyboards for participating this evening, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. <laughs>